Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the room, our audience. Um, I'd like to thank my panelists here today for being here. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, in particular Makram, for putting this all together, um, and the, um, for AUB for hosting us, as well as the American Jews Foundation for allowing me the opportunity a couple of years ago to um, continue my work, to continue my research. Um, you're going to have to forgive me um, because I will be reading from my paper. It's pretty early for me to rely on my memory, so um, you'll just, uh, um, I'm going to have to apologize in advance. But um, today I'm going to be talking about um, the ways in which the Syrian revolt of 1925 played out in the diaspora or the Mahjar. Um, and in its 1926 inaugural issue, the New York-based magazine, The Syrian World, ran an article titled, Who Are the Druze? So um, this kind of leads you into my title here. Posed within the wider context of the Syrian revolt of 1925, the question was a timely one, as the author acknowledged early on, and I quote, few people in history have aroused as much curiosity as are these people whom the present revolution in Syria has suddenly thrust into the limelight of publicity. It is within this same context that famed scholar Philip Hitti wrote a book on the Druze later published in 1928. Although intending to demystify their origins, Hitti nevertheless likened them to, and I quote again, social fossils in an alien environment, end quote. Both of these texts fashion the Druze as John is faced, simultaneously timeless as well as contemporary in their significance and their outlook. Writing in the Druze New York-based Al Bayan newspaper, however, Amir Shakib Arslan insisted time and time again on the historic and current place of the Druze in the wider Muslim and Arab context. Elsewhere in the Mahjar, Arabic-speaking migrants of the Eastern Mediterranean fiercely debated the identities and motives of the Druze in their leading role as architects of the anti-French rebellion in 1925. Launched by the Druze leader Sultan Pasha al-Atrash, the Syrian revolt placed the Druze in the French mandate um, on center stage in international politics. In a history well known to the, um, through the work of many people in this room, including Dr. Schabler, Dr. Provence, and I believe I saw Dr. Baini here yesterday, um, to name a few, the rebellion spread across various cross sections of Syrian society, uniting urban center and countryside. Heavily censored by the French mandatory government, however, Atrash and other rebel leaders came to depend on their compatriots in the Mahjar to make their case known um, against French colonialism known to the world. In effect, diaspora mobilizations created networks linking mandatory politics to actors in Europe, in the Americas, and beyond, weighing on a mandate governance or infrastructure that became particularly vulnerable to such immigrant politics. This was never more apparent than when Amir Shakib Arslan came to visit the United States in, 19, in January 1927 to attend the New, Syrian, uh, New Syria Party Convention in Flint, Michigan. In February 1926, Syrian immigrants in Detroit founded the New Syria Party to support the cause of Syrian unity and independence. The party was headed by General Secretary Abbas Abu Shakra and claimed to have around 40 chapters in the United States, Canada, and even Mexico. The arrival of the overseas guests, namely Emir Shakib Arslan from Lausanne, as well as Nassim Seba from Cairo, created much fanfare, as well as Concord. For those who rather placed their faith in the French mandate, however, Arslan was not welcome in the United States. His mainly Maronite critics wished to see the realization of a Lebanese state independent of Syria, one that would act as a safeguard for the Christian minorities of the region, and the Syrian revolt that Arslan championed threatened this vision. Arslan's opponents thus lobbied their government officials 
and U.S. representatives to have him deported on the grounds that he would sow the seeds of dissension among the Syrian immigrants of the United States. Sorry, I meant to show this, this slide right here. Drawing on documents from the French and U.S. diplomatic archives, as well as the Syrian-American press, this paper uses Arslan's mobility throughout the United States as a lens through which to navigate internal divisions in the wider Syrian community. And I'll explain why I put Syrian in quotes here. It tells the story of Arslan's controversial, controversial visit, focusing on the various meanings attached to him by the Syrian-Lebanese diaspora. As I hope to show, Arslan's visit demonstrates more specifically how Ottoman-era rivalry between Maronites and the Druze was translated in a diasporic context, a diasporic interwar context specific to immigrants in the United States. As the revolt drew on immigrants in the diaspora, it provoked questions of identity politics in the Mahjar that were transnational in scope. The debates on Drew's identity and motives were emblematic of a wider one over the heterogeneity, the diversity of the Syrian Lebanese immigrants. Having left before the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, immigrants of the Eastern Mediterranean struggled to make sense of their multiplicities in a changing political landscape that complicated their place within the emerging nation-state framework, as well as within the broader Syrian ethnic group that developed in the Mahjar. Arslan's visit, therefore, underscores the ways in which Syrian-Lebanese um, diasporic engagement with the politics of the United States created opportunities for migrants to mobilize um, in favor of diverging views of homeland. In juxtaposition to what had become this identifiable ethnic category of Syrian, I argue that divisions in the Syrian-Lebanese migrant community complicated their imaginings of a political community of Syrians. Arslan's visit demonstrates the ways in which ethnic mobilization of Syrian-Lebanese in the U.S. was contingent upon these internal distinctions. More specifically, Syrian-Lebanese immigrants understood and employed ethnicity and race in differing ways that produced and reflected internal and external politics of belonging to the United States and homeland, respectively, to draw from um, Rogers Bubaker here. Placing an overwhelming emphasis on Christian immigrants from Mount Lebanon, scholars on the history of Arab, Arab immigration to the United States have brought our attention to the construction of this Syrian ethnic identity or category at the turn of the 20th century. Such an umbrella category encompassing migrants from various localities throughout greater Syria um, or the Eastern Mediterranean was born in the fluid context of empire, but met with tension in the post-war period. Beginning in the 1880s, immigrants from greater Syria traveled to the Americas in the thousands, bringing their particular attachments to sect, to family, to village with them. By World War I, there were an estimated 100,000, if not more, such Syrians residing in the United States. Although accurate numbers are hard to come by, by the 1920s, there were probably an estimated 1,000 or more Druze immigrants in the United States, mostly men. In 1908, El Bakura Durzia, or the first Druze Association, was established in Seattle, Washington, with the aim of fostering a sense of solidarity um, among Druze immigrants and providing resources and support for those in need. In subsequent years, its branches spread throughout the United States, providing the organizational basis for Druze organizations and mobilizations to follow. As part of the Nahda movement, Syrian Lebanese literati began to articulate proto nationalist schemas in the in 1870s, just as mass immigration from the region began to take place. While the majority of immigrants hailing from the Eastern Mediterranean were, of course, of peasant background uh, or laborers, those educated in Protestant or Jesuit missionary schools of Beirut would have been exposed to ethnic terminology that was birthed in the second half of the 19th century that advanced both Arab and non-Arab variants of this Syrian identity or Syrianism. Um, in particular, among those intellectuals of the Mahjar who played a role in articulating what it meant to be Syrian was Philip Hetti. Um, in, in 1924, he writes this book, The Syrians in America, 
and in it he described the Syrians as a mixed Semitic race, um, and Syria as a land that stretched from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean. According to Heti, the diversity of Syria's history, it's the diversity of its people um, and de- topography explained why, and I quote, clannishness and local attachments to family, religion, and village remain so obstinate in the Mahjar, and why, and I quote him, the Syrian is, a, is, the, is the man without a country par excellence, end quote. While Heti depicted a mosaic model, it is the case that early immigrants from um, Syria or greater Syria primarily identified as Syrian. Upon entering Ellis Island, immigrants from the eastern Mediterranean were automatically classified as Turks when they first arrived. A shift in a label to Syrian around 1900 occurred within a larger context of Syrian efforts to mobilize by, or naturalize by arguing that they actually belonged to a white race and thus eligible for citizenship according to standards at the time. And this work has been, you know, brilliantly sort of um, demonstrated in the work of Sarah Gualteri. Thus, for those entering Ellis Island, choosing this all-encompassing category of Syrian was a functional choice, providing immigrants with a unifying ethnic designation with which to situate themselves vis-a-vis their host society. It did not, however, correspond to a political vision for the majority of these immigrants. This begins to change with the outbreak of World War I and France's declaration of Greater Lebanon in 1920. As Carol Hakim and others have um, aptly pointed out, the idea of an independent Lebanese nation was up until Greater Lebanon's establishment amenable to change. Nor did the establishment of Greater Lebanon happen according to an organized Lebanese nationalist scheme. Rather, those articulating various nationalist schemes formed a diverse group of Lebanese activists, many who you know, were um, living in the Mahjar, with flexible and fluid political visions. The political vision of ex- an expanded Syrian, uh, sorry, an expanded and separate Lebanese state served to expose these differences within this Syrian community in the Mahjar. The declaration of Greater Lebanon prompted politically minded immigrants in the, in the United States to make the case for a separate Lebanese identity. In 1921, Naum Makarzil, editor of the New York-based Al Huda and president of the Lebanon League of Progress, cabled the French to inform them that perhaps the Americans had not yet been officially notified that Mount Lebanon was now independent of Syria. He based his um, conclusion on the persistence of the American postal designation Mount Lebanon, sla- or, comma, Syria. Mukarza pressed this cause in yet another missive in 1921 in which he insisted that Lebanon and its people be treated differently than Syrians. U.S. relations prompted this particular entreaty. Mukarza claimed that in Roanoke, Virginia, and I quote him, Syrians are placed in the same category as blacks. That is, they refused to sell land in, this, in a certain part of the city to both blacks and Syrians, end quote. Interpreting this as an insult to the Lebanese, Mukarza's impassioned response to the situation in Roanoke was to declare, and I quote him again, we are independent Lebanese, completely different from the Syrians, and we expect you, i.e. France, to protect us because you're considered one of our representatives, end quote. Despite these growing differences, the term Syrian persisted as a catch-all designation for Arabic-speaking population in the United States, one that continued to be employed, especially when addressing other Americans. Yet Arslan's visit brought to the fore two camps, one Lebanese, the other Syrian, as the Mahjar debated the 1925 Syrian revolt. Although the French declaration of Greater Lebanon made it a political possibility, it was the revolt that threatened its fruition. Rebel declarations for a united Syria that included lands formerly annexed to Greater Lebanon, primarily in the Baqa', not only challenged the political vision of a separate Lebanese state, um, but also reopened past sectarian wounds. The crossing of rebels into Wadi al-Taym in southern Lebanon and the concomitant targeting of Christians by a few rebel factions in mixed villages provoked a heated debate about the character and legitimacy of the rebellion. This debate took on racialized undertones in the Syrian-American context. 
In January 1927, the State Department received well over 50 communications from Syrian Lebanese communities throughout the United States protesting the presence of Amir Shakib Arslan in their adopted country. Arslan was a man of many attributes, a Jews notable, as well as a former Ottoman diplomat turned Arabic and Islamic nationalist. After the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, Arslan continued his work from Geneva, where he built himself an, a reputation as an unofficial representative of the Syrian people to the League of Nations, as well as the mouthpiece of Syrian rebels to the outside world. Arslan and his supporters touted these international credentials, suggesting in many ways that they reflected his modernity in a post-war world. Yet in the context of a reigning rebellion in Syria, Arslan's adversaries, adversaries inflected his past and present activities with a language reminiscent of wider debates over immigration and naturalization in, in a United States that at the time was you know, going through a period of nativism, much as the United States is going through a period of anti-immigration, anti-immigrant sentiment today. Arslan's Ottomanism, as well as his close proximity to Jamal Pasha, as you know, outlined by Graham Pitts, and Talha Cicek uh, during the First World War put him at, at odds with persec persecuted Christian communities. His opponents associated him with the late Ottoman administration's persecution of Lebanese and Syrians during the war. And although he disputed these accusations, but based on this contentious past, um, as well as his support for the Syrian revolt, um, from his Geneva residence, the Maronites of the United States in particular described Arslan as a dangerous alien in the eyes of his US adversaries. They described him as a political adventurist, an opportunist who was coming to the United States to take the advantage of um, the generosity of American citizens. In other words, um, he was the opposite of what they saw as a good Christian Syrian American citizen. Um, his characterization went beyond um, an, an undesirable alien. Others, like Najib Barbour of New York, described him as you know, belonging to a, fate, uh, a race that was actually inimical or contrary or opposite of their own race. And I suggest that the racialization of Arslan and his fellow Druze was a reflection of Syrian Christian arguments for naturalization in a United States that was becoming increasingly anti-immigrant, in pleading for U.S. intervention in the form of deporting him, they appealed to the role of the United States as a great Christian nation that should not be welcoming people like Arslan. However, his supporters, on the other hand, appealed um, to a different understanding of Americanness and what it meant to be American. To them, Arslan was a nationalist leader who was instrumental in pleading Syria's case to the world. When it came to their non-Christian identities, Arslan supporters situated their diversity within the broader narrative of US secularism and democracy. For Fred Massey, and also known as Farid Abu Muslih of Michigan, the Christians opposing Arslan were but a small portion of a majority of um, Syrians, a group of very diverse Syrians that it also included Muslims and Druze. While it was true that Massey identified as Deruz, he was, and I quote him, an American citizen first and foremost, and one who has spent the greater part of his life in America, end quote. Massey also spoke in his capacity as a former captain of World War I, and further claimed that there were, quote, many if not more Deruz in American uniforms as there were Maronites, end quote. In their defense of Arslan, and here's an eight-page letter that he wrote to um, Frank Kellogg in 1927. It's a really moving letter. Um, in their defense of Arslan, Syrian emigres such as Massey thereby asserted the presence of Druze as part of the American fabric, welcoming Arslan temporarily into their community and thereby substan substantiating his claims by situating him within a uniquely American discourse. As such, his allies appealed to the United States to act in its capacity as a secular and liberal democracy. While in the US, Arslan also drew parallels between the American Revolution and the Syrian cause. 
He was confident that Americans would be able to empathize with the Syrian population and is, quoting, is quoted as having said, and I quote, I take it that the American people see in their nas Syrian nationalist movement a reflection of their own ideals. For my countrymen are fighting for the very same ideals for which the American people rose in arms in 1776, end quote. At the heart of contending visions, uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis Amir Sheki Barslan were opposing views of the revolt itself and the Druze in it. When Christian communities were targeted in Wadi al-Taim after rebels entered Lebanon in November 1925, Mukarzil saw an opportunity to condemn the rebellion as one plagued by Druze sectarianism. Al-Huda frequently asserted that attacks on the Christians of Lebanon belied the anti-colonial motives of the rebellion. Responding to Al-Huda's accusations, the New York-based journal al Bayan, published by the Druze immigre Suleiman Badur, asserted that Mukarzil and his supporters were fanning the flames, instead that they were fanning the flames of sectarianism for profit. In response to the charge that the Druze were only loyal to their co-religionists, al Bayan reader Hassan Hussein Abu Hassan from North Adams proclaimed, and I'm quoting him, we are zealous towards homeland and not towards religion. The Druze of Lebanon, he asserted, supported the Hauran Druze, and I quote, not because they share a faith, as Mukarzil alleges, but because they are patriots who fight for liberation of their dear homeland from the grasp of the colonizers, end quote. French and U.S. surveillance of Arslan allow us to chart the mechanisms of surveillance which were in many ways made possible by Syrian, well-entrenched Syrian networks in the United States. As the Syrian rebellion gained international attention, the French became acutely concerned with the activities of Syrian immigrants. The French assigned Commander Peshkov to monitor Arslan on the Detroit Congress. Believing that the Americans largely funded the rebellion in Syria, the conference would be critical in allowing them to finally learn how it is that the Syrian community of the United States was getting money over to the rebels in Syria. Yet as the revolt had been largely suppressed by 1927, the French were actually more concerned about the harmful effects of negative propaganda against the French mandate and their public image. So Peshkov also endeavored to counter propaganda through local Syrian Lebanese networks. His meetings with Barbour, for example, resulted in a number of letters by Barbour to the French and American officials stressing the seriousness of Arslan's visit. And Peshkov's meetings with Mukarzil confirmed the need to maintain communication with Syrian colonies abroad as Mukarzil reproached French consuls for distancing themselves from Syrian Lebanese communities. American surveillance of the traveling Syrian delegation reflected the tensions of a State Department ill-equipped to make decisions about Arslan. After verifying the legality of Arslan's visit, visa, the department made use of its nascent division of Near Eastern Affairs, which tended to confirm Arslan's reputation as an international fig uh, figure of significant import for the majority of Syrian communities in the U.S., the department assigned Special Agent Frank Higgins to follow Arslan in Seba. Like Peshkov, Higgins also reached out to well-rooted um, Syrian communities to help out. The observations of Special Agent Higgins at times reflected concerns particular to the United States, primarily over anxieties over Bolshevism as it intersected with race. Syrians in New York tipped Higgins about Arslan's trip to Boston, where he met with local Syrians and also reportedly networked with Bolshevik circles. Higgins noted that many Muslim Druze and dark-skinned peoples of various ethnicities visited Arslan in his hotel room. He also followed him to a meeting put on by the League of Neighbors, who, according to Higgins, was one of the numerous Bolshevik sympathizing, unpatriotic American organizations of better-class people who ought to know better, end quote. In the words of Higgins, Arslan was, and I quote, not a heroic figure, although the chairman alluded to him as a Syrian George Washington, the special agent refro refrained from approaching Arslan but concluded, concluded with a sense of superiority that um, at any time the State Department could pick him up as soon as they formulated a policy um, based on this evident alliance with radical elements in the U.S. and uh, avowed military antagonism to France, end quote. So in concluding... 
After all that was said and done, the United States did not deport Arslan. In its um, attempts, in, in its response to complaints against Arslan, the State Department stressed the legal, legality of his visa, as well as enumerated his notable background um, and the nature of his nationalist work. Yet his mobility was treated as a vector with the trans for the transmission of information and propaganda. Accordingly, his travels became a site of political struggle in which Syrian Americans negotiated their place in the United States and upon which they enacted their long distance nationalisms. As a result, even as Seba and Arslan moved freely throughout the United States, their mission did not travel with the same ease. It was fraught with political baggage, foisted upon them by the well-rooted immigrant communities they encountered, as well as by the American and French governments. Nevertheless, in gaining visibility, they also shed light on the diversity within the Syrian-Lebanese community of the United States that included a very vibrant and politically sophisticated Druze community. Thank you. Thank you.